Welcome to the Sexual Harassment Prevention Training for the Connecticut State Department of Transportation. My name is Eric Smith. I am the Equal Employment Opportunity Director at DOT. Our office is at 2800 uh, Berlin Turnpike in Newington at the headquarters. And you can also reach us by email and by phone. Uh, at the end of this presentation, you'll be given uh, an email address that you can use if you have any questions about today's training. We want you to send us any questions or concerns that you may have, and we will address those questions in response to your email. During this training, we're going to cover some training that is provided by the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. This training is required for all employers in the state of Connecticut that every employee have this training which is two hours in length and at the end of each session there's going to be a quiz and uh, if you're taking this in a maintenance garage the supervisor should be providing you with a copy of the policy a copy of the questions for the quiz that you can answer on your own as we go through this. And at the end of this training, we need each employee to complete the debrief form so that we can have a record of your completion of the training and send you uh, a certificate and update your record in the training log. So today, our agenda We'll be covering what sexual harassment is. We're going to be getting into examples of what behavior might be considered sexual harassment and what the state and the federal laws say and define sexual harassment as for the workplace. We're going to be going over the best practices for remedying sexual harassment. We want to give you some practical uh, ideas and tools that you can use so that when situations happen, you know what to do to respond and who to report it to. Because we want to make sure that each employee of DOT can be able to come into work and not experience harassing behavior and sexual behavior that is in violation of our policies. This training today is done to put every employee on notice of what the expectations are for each one of you in terms of behavior when it relates to sexual harassment and also if you witness sexual harassment what to do to report it. Sexual harassment is a very serious matter and it's become one of the more prevalent types of issues that we handle in the Office of Equal Employment opportunity and diversity. So we're also going to talk about the changing world of sexual harassment claims. If you have watched the news in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of sort of high profile sexual harassment cases. Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, uh, big executives and uh, often male figures, but sexual harassment can happen by females to males, males to males, females to females. We're not singling out any particular um, gender, um, but today we're going to be talking about um, what it is so that you understand. We also will be covering at the end of the training how you can file a complaint of discrimination, what the process is so that you're comfortable and understand what that process looks like and we will be going over the DOT policy and procedure. So this training comes from the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. This is an agency that enforces discrimination and uh, harassment uh, in state agencies. When those things occur, they are the enforcement agency that enforces the state laws that are against a discrimination. 
So this is their uh, website and phone number. Um, whenever an employee comes to our office with a discrimination claim, we are required to notify them of their other options to file complaints externally outside the agency with places like the Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. So this is the agency charged with developing the content of this training and most of the training today that I'll be covering is uh, training that they have developed and provided. So the CHRO's mission is to eliminate discrimination through civil and human rights law enforcement and to establish equal opportunity and justice for all persons within the state through advocacy and education. Uh, if you don't know, CHRO does more than just handle discrimination complaints. They also review every state agency's affirmative action plan to approve or disapprove those plans each year or every two years. They also go out into the community and they provide training in schools to understand um, civil rights laws and engage uh, younger people in the state of Connecticut um, to understand the processes that we have. They also um, bring on interns to understand um, some of the uh, legal enforcement processes that they're involved in. Why are you here? Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, in uh, 2019, the Connecticut legislature passed the Time's Up Act, which was two bills that reformed the sexual harassment laws in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut already had pretty um, stringent, proactive uh, laws in the books before 2019. We were already required to provide two hours of training for supervisors, but now the requirements have been extended to all employees and newly hired employees have to receive this training within six months of their hire. So the difficult part of this law that we're trying to uh, complete is training all of our existing employees, which is over 3,000 for DOT, by the deadline of October 1st, 2020. Um, and then once you've completed this training, there will be a refresher training offered at some time after that, um, most likely around three years or so. Um, but the law doesn't require it um, until 10 years. It's required that you have to take this training again. Um, and the reason for taking these trainings is to make sure that we're all aware of what sexual harassment is and don't tolerate it, don't uh, let it exist in the workplace so that people can feel that they can come to work and feel like they don't have to be putting up with harassing behavior. So um, the legislature felt that there needed to be um, some additional steps taken and some additional um, training conducted to make sure that um, victims of sexual harassment don't feel that they don't have a voice and don't have a, a means of getting their complaints addressed. There are also new notice requirements for employees. Uh, when you are hired by the DOT, you will receive uh, information about the sexual harassment policy at DOT and also uh, you know, information on contacts that you can call or email to uh, understand more about what sexual harassment is or complaints and filing. So those are posted on bulletin boards throughout the headquarters building and uh, various locations throughout the state. And also on our intranet under affirmative action, you will find all the policies that we handle, including sexual harassment. And uh, so that puts everyone on notice of what their rights are. Um, and the CHRO as part of these new laws was required to develop this training and make it available for free. Rather than have you take their training online, which is somewhat complicated um, with several separate videos, we decided to develop this training as a simplified version 
where you just watch the single video and respond with a form at the end. Just a disclaimer for the CHRO portion of these slides is that Connecticut Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities cannot give legal advice nor can they comment on specific situations you may be experiencing in the workplace. And if you feel that you need to file a complaint about discrimination, you can contact their regional offices. Those regional offices are uh, the place that you would go to depending on which town you work in and which office is closest. So um, we gained permission to use these slides from CHRO and uh, they provided them to us. Um, if you have any questions about the CHRO portion of the slides, you can contact CHRO. Uh, I believe it's chro.questions at ct.gov. So we're going to talk about sexual harassment at work. What is sexual harassment? This definition comes from the Connecticut General Statutes 46A, 60B8, and it's very similar to the federal definitions of sexual harassment. This has been true for a long time and hasn't changed. And I just want to point out some of the keywords that we look at in determining if behavior is sexual harassment. One of those keywords is unwelcome. It's any unwelcome sexual advances or requests for sexual favors or any conduct of a sexual nature and I also highlight the word sexual nature because some things may be related to gender and or sometimes they're not sexual in nature and that may play a role in determining if it was sexual harassment or not so unwelcome and of a sexual nature and then you have three main points a b and c Point A and B have to do with what we call quid pro quo sexual harassment. So whether that submission to the conduct is made explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of a person's employment, or whether B, the submission or rejection of the conduct by an individual is used as the basis for employment decisions affecting the individual. That's a lot of legal language, but basically it just means that um, Sexual harassment can be by somebody that has power over the other person, such as a supervisor, and makes sexual requests of their subordinate. And in those cases, it's very difficult for an agency to defend on a legal basis um, because it can affect that person's pay, that person's job assignment, and um, tangible things that affect their employment. Uh, as a supervisor. That's why we used to require at least supervisors to get this training and uh, we made sure that they took it every few years. The third part of the definition is that the conduct would have the purpose or effect of substantially interfering with an individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. That's what we call hostile work environment sexual harassment. So that's the more prevalent type of sexual harassment that we see in the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. This um, is not to be confused with when people use the term hostile work environment, I'm working in a hostile work environment. That may be true, but what we're talking about today is because of a unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature causing hostile work environment, not because I don't like you or because uh, so-and-so is picking on me because I did something last week that he didn't like. Um, these are things that are not handled by our Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. It may be harassment. It may be um, uh, treatment that is inappropriate and may violate other agency policies, but what we're talking about today is sexual harassment that causes a hostile work environment or is a quid pro quo sexual harassment situation. And I understand that um, we're training all sorts of employees and this might not be something that you 
have paid particular attention to. So I'm trying to make it simple and relatable for each person. But um, again, quid, quid pro quo is a legal term, but it just means this for that. If you do this for me, then I'll do that for you. If you will come to, to dinner with me and we'll talk about the promotion you've been looking for, and then there may be the, an expectation of something like a sexual encounter or relationship that is expected after that dinner. And so those types of things should never be discussed in a restaurant or in a social setting so that there's clearly no connection with, uh, even if it's consensual behavior, that there should be no connection with the person's job or benefits. Um, and if you're a supervisor, we do not have a policy that, that says you cannot date people that are in your line of supervision, but it's common sense and it's a good practice that if that does occur, if you are in a relationship with somebody that is in your line of supervision, let HR know, let human resources know, so that maybe there's a, a way that one of you can be reassigned. Um, because that should not happen where um, two people in a relationship or married to each other are in the same line of supervision. And uh, even if it's consensual, there could be a, a potential sexual harassment claim by someone who is observing and works in the unit but is not uh, a beneficiary of that relationship. For example, the supervisor gives the better work assignments to the person that they're dating and the other people in the office get the less desirable jobs and these types of things would be called third-party sexual harassment um, and it's not quid pro quo in that situation but it's still a type of sexual harassment that we would have to address so I've given you some examples already um, offering a job or a promotion in terms of sexual return for sexual favors, threatening to cut hours if you won't date the person who is the supervisor, offering a better schedule or a raise if you send the boss nice nude pictures, um, threatening a performance review if you don't go out to dinner with them. And hostile work environment. Uh, is when a co-worker, supervisor, or a third party makes repeated, inappropriate, and unwanted sexual advances, comments, or requests. We use the term repeated and unwanted um, because, uh, for example, if someone asks somebody out on a date and it's a one-time thing and then the person politely says no and the person leaves them alone, would that be sexual harassment? No, it would not um, because the behavior stopped. Um, it may have been unwanted, um, but it's when it becomes repeated and inappropriate and makes the workplace more and more uncomfortable for that other person. Um, and it, it's a good idea to express to the person when you're not interested and let them know so that there is no misunderstanding. But sometimes people don't feel comfortable doing that. And if you don't feel comfortable, it's a good idea to let a supervisor know so that they can intervene and help, help handle the situation. So a hostile work environment because of sexual harassment would include uh, sexual favoritism, um, males over females or females over males. Um, it may be verbal, it may be physical or visual. So, I'll talk about a few examples of sexual harassment. And when we talk about the DOT sexual harassment policy, I'm going to bring up a few more examples. But here you have people that are at work and they talk about sex all day long. Um, that would not be appropriate for the workplace. There are posters or scantily dressed models in the workplace. Now, your workplace could be in a garage, it could be an office building. Um, it could be in a, another type of building out in the community, out in the towns, in the districts. Um, and these days, I don't think too many people have much uh, visual things hanging around, but they might have something in their office. 
And if, if it's something that's inappropriate for the workplace, you should take it down. Um, other people could walk by and see that poster and be bothered or offended by that. Um, now there's always a fine line where a person is um, allowed to have their personal things uh, in their workplace. So if there's any question, um, you can contact Affirmative Action or even Human Resources to um, sort of give you some guidance on that when there is an issue. We should not be commenting about other people's bodies in a sexual uh, offensive way. You know, some people may appreciate that or some people might be the, the kind of person that likes to hear things like that. But in a state workplace, we don't want to have comments like that. Those are things that somebody could consider sexual harassment. So don't do it. Um, even if it's complimenting somebody, you know, um, it could be taken the wrong way. Um, now, we're just also saying use good judgment, use common sense. We're not saying that you can't compliment anybody for anything, but if you're, you're getting uh, really in a personal way talking about a person's body parts and uh, the size of their body parts that um, turns you on or something like that, obviously that's going to make the person feel uncomfortable. So things that are um, polite, complimentary, and not going to make somebody feel uncomfortable is what we should be saying and, and not things that are going to cause an environment where somebody feels very self-conscious. So if somebody at work touches you without your consent, that could be sexual harassment. It could be sexual assault in some cases where we would need to call the authorities, uh, local police, um, you know, even somebody giving back rubs, shoulder massages, that's not appropriate for the workplace. Um, referring to female employees as bitches or any other kind of derogatory term, um, and there could be a derogatory male term as well. Um, these types of things could be considered sexual harassment. And sexual harassment really is a form of sex discrimination, uh, gender discrimination under the uh, federal and state laws. So um, it, it can be related to gender and not necessarily just um, you know, sexual favors. Making negative comments about breastfeeding or about pregnancy. You know, these are things that are related to an individual's sex or, or pregnancy status. And pregnancy is a separate um, protection in the state of Connecticut. Um, in our state laws, we call them protected classes, such as race, such as color, such as um, sex, age. Um, protected classes are, are in the laws to say that in the workplace, no one should be treated differently harassed or discriminated against because of being a member of one of these classes, because of being pregnant, um, because of being, um, uh, you know, a female, because of being an older person. These are um, things that and would be a violation if it's found that there was discrimination um, because of those things. Sexual harassment really at its basis is an abuse of power. It's not usually about whether someone can um, have sex with the other person or get into a relationship with the person. It's usually about a power struggle and having authority to, to have someone else do what they want. So sexual harassment is not funny. Um, I know a lot of times people want to encourage the morale in the workplace and try to make jokes, but if it's sexually related jokes or racially related jokes, those are things that should never be um, in the workplace. You know, it might be innocent or seem innocent, but I don't want any of you employees getting in trouble. And we would not like to have to see you in our office with a complaint filed against you because of uh, a bad choice of telling a joke or trying to be funny. It's not a way to show someone that you like them by talking about their body parts. 
or telling them that you're attracted to them, you know, um, during your, your lunch break, after work, outside of the workplace, there's um, plenty of ways that you can socialize and, um, you know, have relationships. But um, in the workplace, um, we do have our policies that um, make sure that it, everybody doesn't experience harassment. So it, it can make people feel small, it can make people feel threatened, it can be demeaning. Um, and also, um, when we talk about a gender or a sexual orientation, um, it can be harassing. Um, if people get picked on uh, because of their gender, picked on because of their sexual orientation, um, you know, these are violations of our policies in the state law. Sexual harassment does not require touching. Um, there is a reasonable person standard that we follow so that if you're accused of sexual harassment and you feel that this is a false charge and you know one person says well he looked at me funny or he was too close to me or or switched the the gender she looked at me funny she was too close to me and when we look at those situations we have to say what would a reasonable person think is harassment um, would a reasonable person think that if you're six inches away from me that it's sexual harassment was that the person's intent um, these are things that come into play so that anybody accused of sexual harassment also has due process rights to provide their side of the story um, to provide witnesses and information for evidence so that when we look at um, these claims um, it's not an automatic, you're fired. It's not an automatic um, accusation and a done deal. We do an investigation and look at both sides of the, of the evidence provided. So um, we come down with our decision based on the amount of evidence that shows who was providing the most um, logical story that most likely happened. Was it the victim of sexual harassment who claimed this or the person um, that was accused, the respondent? Um, does their story make sense? Did they change their story? Were there people around that witnessed that would corroborate that? So I just wanted to say that to say, um, when you're accused of sexual harassment, you do have rights as well. So even if somebody said something that was meant to be a joke or a compliment, it could be considered sexual harassment. So I know a lot of people will say, I can't say anything. I can't even compliment somebody. You know, just use your best judgment. Um, and uh, that's all I can say. Um, it can happen inside and outside of work. So even if you are at a Christmas party and everybody's drinking, and it's not your normal workplace, it's after work hours, but you're with people that you work with. And something happens because somebody had too many drinks or did something stupid and maybe touched somebody inappropriately. But then you have to come to work with that person on Monday. So that could be sexual harassment because there is a nexus, there's a connection to the workplace. So if you're gonna, um, encounter people that you work with outside of work, please be conscious of behavior so that, um, you know, when people come to work after a situation like that, they're going to avoid one another. They're going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to um, have a really difficult time working together. So if it's required that they have to work together, like protecting each other on the roads, um, you know, where there's a safety concern, that could be a problem because um, people are, have feelings about what happens. Um, so we also need to address these situations promptly. If you're a supervisor and notice that your employees are avoiding one another, find out what their uh, issues are. Um, sit down with them and if, if something uh, sexually related, se sexual harassment allegations come up, contact the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity immediately. And what makes a sexual hostile environment? We look at the words severe and pervasive. So that's the standard we follow. 
Does it interfere with the person's work performance? Does the conduct uh, seem threatening or humiliating? And what was the nature of the conduct? How frequent is the conduct? Who is protected by sexual harassment laws? Everybody you see here, employees, interns, temporary workers, um, you know, CHRO also covers housing. So that would be where tenants uh, or people renting comes in to, to play. Um, and visitors to places of accommodations. We're a state agency. So um, we sometimes have uh, public meetings where people of the public come and uh, we need to make sure um, you know, that they have accommodations if needed. And if they're there, they shouldn't be sexually harassed. And if they are, then that's something that we would have to deal with. Um, if it was our meeting that we're providing. So interns, I always like to emphasize because a lot of times sexual harassment happens to those that have less rights. Um, their job is temporary. Maybe they do not have union protection. They don't know all the policies of the agency. Sometimes these are younger employees that may not have the experience and the understanding that other employees have. And when it comes to doing what a supervisor or director tells you to do, you're going to want to comply because you want that internship. You want the opportunity. And um, if you don't comply, you're afraid that you might lose that experience. So you might be afraid to come forward. And that's what sometimes sexual harassers do is to take advantage of that situation and the unequal power structure. So we want to make sure that if we have interns working at DOT, that they're aware that they should not be sexually harassed, that they can come forward. And if anybody is training interns or temporary workers, that they've had this training so that they understand that they should not be taking advantage of those individuals. So who can be a sexual harasser? It could be any number of people, a supervisor, a coworker, our policy does cover vendors, visitors, contractors, could be those temporary workers, and even others that I haven't thought of. So when we say sexual harassment could happen by a vendor or contractor, those are sometimes more complicated issues to deal with because they're not our employees. But if it affects the workplace where DOT workers come and, and work, then um, they should not experience sexual harassment. And they're the contractors and vendors are required to abide by our policies. A lot of times it's even written into their contracts. So we would have to look into those issues, investigate those issues if appropriate. And if it's having to report that vendor or contractor to their agency, to their employer, we would need to do that. And sometimes they would um, be barred from having to come onto our premises or remove temporarily while the investigation is going on. And we'd probably work with that agency to make sure that the appropriate action is taken for the individual, because we can't discipline um, those that are not our employees. Um, where can sexual harassment happen? I've mentioned already the example of an office holiday party. Um, obviously, it could happen in the workplace. It could happen at happy hour after work. Social media. A lot of times people are friends on social media with Facebook, Instagram. So there's no prohibition against that. But sometimes you have knowledge of people's personal lives and you should not take advantage of that. Um, you might be friends now, but there might be something that happens and then all of a sudden you could go and cyber bully that person and it could really affect the workplace. So, you know. You don't need to be Facebook friends um, with people that you work with. It's probably a good idea if you're not, um, especially as a supervisor because of uh, perceptions that people may have. But um, it's not um, prohibited. Uh, you know, people are Facebook friends. It's not that big a deal usually, but it could potentially become a problem. So um, also text messages can be sexually harassing, um, especially if somebody sends pictures of body parts. Um, these are things that are 
often the subject of investigations and could be retrievable. If you're using a personal cell phone in the workplace um, as a means of doing your work, um, you know, keep in mind, you know, even, and if it's a state cell phone as well, um, there should be no um, inappropriate um, pictures and, and texts um, sent to employees. Um, so um, these are difficult issues sometimes to, to deal with because we use our cell phones all the time. But again, common sense is to not send something that you don't want to be out there in the world. And, you know, you don't want to be having to deal with that picture used against you, um, you know, with other coworkers and for other workplaces. Um, just don't do it. The cafeteria could be a place where sexual harassment happens. You might be on your break. You might be, you know, off the clock for that period of time. You might still be at work or you might be outside of work, but sexual harassment could still happen if it's with coworkers and um, it doesn't matter. Uh, these are things that we would still have to investigate and still look into. Um, so it can happen almost anywhere. And travel, if you're, job takes you in a state car across the state or a state vehicle, state truck, um, and you're in a truck with somebody else most of the day, some of you, um, that's part of your workplace. There should be no sexual harassment just because you're sitting in a truck together. Or if you're out on the roads and you're, you know, out in public, those are also places that you should not be engaging in sexual harassment. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter um, whether we're in an office or where our job takes us. If we should avoid inappropriate behavior. Other examples of sexual harassment are sexual propositions, threats, lewd comments or jokes. You know, people sometimes make innuendos about, you know, implying sexual things or that's what she said. Um, and might seem funny, you know, but then there's going to be somebody that's going to take it the wrong way and it's not, not appropriate for the workplace. So avoid unwanted or inappropriate touching. Um, you know, we're not supposed to touch each other anyways during this COVID-19, uh, pandemic. So, um, hopefully that's not happening, but in, when we get back to regular business, if we, if that happens at some point, um, you know, shoulder massages, um, usually handshakes are not a problem, but, um, it, you know, if you're hugging somebody or, um, gesturing and, and patting them in some sort of strange way, um, you know, don't do that. Um, sexual gestures, there could be, um, objects that resemble sexual parts brought into the workplace. Those should not be there. Um, looking at pornography during the workplace, whether it's on your personal device or whether it's on a state computer. If it's on a state computer, you could be subject to inappropriate use of um, state systems. So you don't want that, and you also don't want to have a fact-finding investigation um, for, for that type of thing. Um, and obscene noises or leering um, saying, hey, honey, or, you know, whistling as somebody walks by or, mm, you know, um, things that um, would make the person self-conscious and uncomfortable. Use your common sense. Um, or if you're, uh, whether you're male or female, um, if you have uh, a kid that, you know, you care about your kid and you don't want them being uh, the object of sexual harassment, then, you know, think about um, not engaging in that type of behavior. So I want you to take a look at the first quiz, and then we're going to go over it. So if you have that sheet with quiz number one on it, take a look at that. Is sexual harassment is it sexual harassment to ask a coworker out on a date? What do you think? Yes, no, or it depends. I'm going to say it depends because it could be sexual harassment. It depends on the situation. 
like I said, if it's repeated and if it's um, making the person uncomfortable, um, that's where it would be sexual harassment. I would say most of the time, and with most people, it would not be sexual harassment um, because if it was a one-time thing and the person wasn't severe in the way that they were asking and pervasive and making them feel uncomfortable, then most likely it's not. So it depends. Number two, sexual harassment, can it happen outside of work? What do you think? Yes, it can. Number three, my supervisor told me that if I wanted to improve my performance, I should meet him for dinner at his apartment. Is this A, quid pro quo sexual harassment, B, hostile work environment, or C, neither? The answer is quid pro quo. This is the type of situation where the supervisor has unequal bargaining power and the dinner at the apartment is never the appropriate place to discuss performance issues. Four, my coworkers are constantly discussing their sex lives at work and it is making it hard for me to do work. Is this A, quid pro quo harassment, B, a hostile work environment, or C, neither? And the answer is B, hostile work environment. Discussing sex lives is not necessarily a situation where there's a supervisor with power over the other person, um, but it makes the workplace a hostile place to have to work if you're really uncomfortable with that type of discussion. And as a supervisor, should not be condoning that type of discussion in the workplace. I'm going to show you a short video at this time. And this video is just going over some of the basic concepts that we've already discussed. Effects of sexual harassment in the workplace. Sexual harassment is not just a little locker room talk, a compliment, innocent flirting, or an invitation to share a cup of coffee. Workplace harassment is a discriminatory pattern of behavior that creates a hostile work environment based on a protected class. It may involve verbal abuse and abuse of power, sexual quid pro quo, and assault, such as unwanted groping. Harassment in the workplace has negative effects on all workers, including decreased performance, low morale, and increased turnover. What is sexual harassment? Harassment is a form of employment discrimination that violates several federal and state laws. Sexual harassment is persistent, unwanted sexual advances, verbal abuse, and or demands for sexual favors. Behavior becomes illegal when enduring the harassment is a condition of continued employment and creates an environment that is hostile or intimidating. If an employer has more than a handful of employees, it's likely harassment will be a problem. There were over 12,860 charges filed with the EEOC alleging sex-based harassment in 2016. One in three women face harassment in the workplace, yet 70% of women say they have never reported it. Effects of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment can affect everyone because it creates an environment that makes it harder for employees to succeed. The possible effects of sexual harassment in the workplace include emotional and physical issues. Victims of sexual harassment often suffer emotional and psychological harm, including stress, depression, and anxiety. They often experience decreased confidence and self-esteem. Physical health problems may arise, such as loss of sleep and appetite, weight fluctuations, nausea, and headaches. Professional and financial problems. Sexual harassment can also wreak havoc on a victim's job performance and career trajectory. Fear and decreased confidence can cause some people to withdraw from the workplace and disengage from coworkers. They are more likely to be tardy, absent, distracted, and neglect duties. If victims of sexual harassment report the harassment, they may suffer advancement setbacks, such as being passed over for promotions, being left out of key meetings, retaliation, and being labeled as a troublemaker. Financial problems like lost wages and unpaid leave are also possible. Decreased company productivity. Sexual harassment is also damaging to an organization. When a workplace is infected with discrimination and harassment, everyone suffers. The hostility created by harassment causes absenteeism, low morale, gossip, animosity, stress, and anxiety among staff. 
low productivity is more common in environments with high rates of sexual harassment. Victims and witnesses of sexual harassment are more likely to quit, leading to high employee turnover and related hiring and training cost increases. A toxic environment will also make recruiting top talent more difficult. Lawsuit and Reputation A company's failure to adequately prevent and handle sexual harassment can result in expensive lawsuits. In the past decade, we have seen some eye-popping jury awards in sexual harassment cases. A jury awarded plaintiffs $17.4 million in a case filed by the EEOC involving rape and sexual harassment by three male supervisors at a Florida packing plant. And $18 million was awarded in a case against a New York Global Group CEO for retaliation against his former employee after she refused his advances. A highly publicized case of sexual harassment can also damage a company's reputation, resulting in lost business. Anti-harassment policy and training. Employers must institute anti-harassment programs that contribute to a welcoming culture where everyone feels they are valuable team members and also attract talented job applicants. A company harassment policy should define harassment and give examples, state that harassment is not tolerated, explain the harassment reporting system with a designated HR person for reporting claims, communicate the disciplinary consequences of harassment, outline the investigation and remediation process, State that retaliation against employees reporting harassment is prohibited. Employers must hold employees and themselves to high standards. Everyone deserves a workplace free from harmful harassment, and all employees should be expected to behave like professional adults while on the job. Not only could workplace harassment lead to expensive lawsuits, it creates a toxic culture that cripples team cohesion and harms productivity. Learn how to avoid these problems and more when you enroll at 360training.com today. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the sexual harassment laws in depth. Um, we did cover this a little bit, but I'm just going to go over them real quick. So where you find the sexual harassment laws um, for the federal government, it's in the Civil Rights Act, Title VII from 1964. And the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination at work on the basis of race, color, sex, national origin, and religion. The EEOC guidelines interpret Title VII sex discrimination um, as a form of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment falls under sex discrimination. So when you see the protected class of sex, it includes sexual harassment. This law applies to all public employees, labor organizations, and employment agencies and private employers with 15 or more employees. That's the federal law. And the Connecticut law we've already talked about, which is where we got our definition from, and it's found at 46A, 60B, 8, and uh, again, we talked about it, it's sex-based employment discrimination. Um, and any employee engaging in sexual harassment, in a sense, is acting on behalf of the employer, harassing the employees. So an employee that's experiencing sexual harassment could have a claim against their employer. And the reason why we do this training for all employees now is that we are trying to avoid liability. We're trying to prevent sexual harassment from occurring because, as you'll see in some of the slides coming up, there are a lot of expenses and uh, undesirable outcomes when it comes to sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, gender identity or expression is another protected class in the state of Connecticut that's not in the federal law. Um, it's under 46A5124, and it's defined as a person's gender-related identity, appearance, or behavior, whether or not that gender-related identity, appearance, or behavior is different than their traditionally associated uh, physiology at birth. So if you were born a male but you identify as a female, um, a transgender individual, you are protected in the state of Connecticut from harassment and discrimination. And sometimes that also comes into play. If you choose to use a bathroom of your choice, the law in Connecticut allows you to do that. 
the laws in Connecticut do not require males to use male bathrooms, females to use female bathrooms. Um, and if a person is uncomfortable with that individual who is transgender using that bathroom with them, the person that has the issue is the one that we have to ask to use a unisex bathroom or another place. Um, or we could be found as an agency in violation of this state law. Connecticut General Statutes 46A5415, this is the requirements of sexual harassment training. And as I started to say at the beginning, um, these are some of the new requirements, including a uh, new sexual harassment poster that CHRO has put out. And as I said, all employees must uh, be provided a copy of this information concerning the illegality of sexual harassment and the remedies available to them. And that has to happen within three months of hire. I think I said six months. I guess it's three. Um, so that law went into effect October 1st, 2019. And um, we can provide new employees with this information through email, posting on our website, um, or in writing. Uh, employers with three or more employees provide two hours of sexual harassment training, which you are experiencing right now um, and that's all employees not just supervisors and we're trying to do that training um, before October 1st of 2020 and it must be updated every 10 years but we may be providing it more frequent than that such as every three years 46A97 um, also says that CHRO can inspect to make sure posters are posted and re records are retained. So CHRO, according to the laws, could come into the agency and make sure that we're posting our uh, sexual harassment um, rights in appropriately. And if we don't, then there are fines of $750 for noncompliance. Um, that's if we don't train our employees as required and if we don't post our um, sexual harassment policy and posters appropriately. So that is new under this law. Um, there is now a penalty, a financial penalty, um, if we're not doing that. Connecticut General Statutes 46A60B8, we've talked about that one, and again, um, requires employers to eliminate harassment and take corrective action. Um, for issues of sexual harassment and cannot modify the work conditions of an employee who complains about sexual harassment without their written consent and with certain exceptions. So it's always been part of best practices to not move the victim who is claiming sexual harassment, but now it's in law that we cannot do that or unless we violate the law without getting their written permission. So the person may want to move and that's okay um, and they can sign something to say that they're in agreement and voluntarily moving um, but otherwise you would move the uh, alleged sexual harasser or just have the two um, you know not assigned to have to come in contact with each, each other um, but we shouldn't be changing the person's you know terms or conditions of their employment without their written express permission so um, we're also looking at remedies for the victim and one of the changes in the new law is that uh, human rights referees, those are people that work at CHRO, are now authorized to award damages necessary to eliminate discriminatory practices and make the complainant whole. So it used to be there were certain awards that um, human referees could um, allow and make, but they were not allowed to make um, certain awards for damages, but now they can, uh, in addition to other uh, things like back pay, front pay, as a result of um, trying to come to a resolution when an individual makes a CHRO complaint uh, against the agency. So these are some of the awards that the human rights referee can give back pay, front pay, attorney's fees, costs, cease and desist orders, um, 
And now emotional distress is, is I believe, one of the new ones, the punitive, punitive damages, um, I guess, in court only. And uh, OK, now at this time, we want to take a look at quiz number two. And we're going to be going over that one together. So the water delivery man always makes comments about the receptionist's clothes and body. He is not a company employee. If she complains to her boss, what can be done? A, the receptionist can be relocated. B, the company can complain to the delivery person's employer and ask them to remedy it. Or C, do nothing because he's not complimenting her or he's complimenting her. D, do nothing because he's not an employee. What do you think the answer is? It is B, the company can complain to the delivery person's employer and ask them to remedy it. Why can't we relocate the receptionist? Because again, that was um, part of the law that you cannot move the alleged victim. Um, and you can't do nothing about alleged sexual harassment. Number two, my coworker posted a picture of me in my swimsuit from the company picnic on his Facebook page without my con consent. Everyone at work is teasing me. Is this sexual harassment? What do you think? Yes, it is. Um, the issue here is that it was without her permission. Um, and some might say um, she was at the party and she was wearing the swimsuit and she was assuming that people would be taking pictures. Um, so, uh, but when you're sharing something that is uh, not consented to by the other individual in the workplace, that could be harassing to them. Um, you know, if, if they posted it and, and they gave their permission, um, uh, I mean, even so, always consider whether the behavior is going to be harassing, whether it's sexual in nature, um, whether the person is, is going to be bothered by that. Um, and, you know, because I guess being in a swimsuit is really not so appropriate to be posted in the workplace. Three, sexual harassment is illegal under A, federal law, B, state law, or C, both. Well, it's both, of course. Number four, if an employer does not follow the posting or training requirements, A, nothing is done, the law is voluntary, B, the owner can go to jail, or C, CHRO can impose a $750 fine. The answer is C, CHRO can now impose a $750 fine. All right, so now we're going to be talking about best practices for preventing and remedying sexual harassment. What should you do if you're being sexually harassed at work? And I've mentioned this a little bit earlier, but if you feel comfortable doing this, ask the harasser to stop. A lot of times you can stop the behavior because maybe the person didn't realize that their requests of you to go on a date or something were just completely you know, disregarded. They just were not interested. Um, maybe they didn't get it. Hopefully they get it, you know, without having to be repeating yourself a couple of two or three times. Look at the company policies um, to see who you need to report sexual harassment to. And I mentioned you report that to a supervisor or a manager, and you can report it directly to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. If you're a supervisor or manager, you should report it immediately to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. And we'll get to that at the end when we talk about the DOT policy. Criminal conduct can be reported to the police as well, you know, such as sexual assault, if that happens in the workplace. Tell your supervisor. You can tell your HR officer or supervisor or any other member of management. You can tell your union rep if you're a member of the union. And you can file a complaint with the CHRO or with the EEOC. And remember, you must do this within 300 days. So initially, you know, prior to October 2019, CHRO had a deadline period of 180 days, and that's now been extended 
to 300 days um, with the laws that we've just been talking about. That was another part of the law. So it gives people more time to file, um, and it also is in line with the federal EEOC um, timeline of 300 days. And when you come to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity, we are the internal process. We encourage you to take advantage of the internal process first, and we try to complete our process within 90 days, and that gives people the opportunity to um, go to CHRO or EEOC if they feel that they need to, and uh, we always notify them of that. Um, but hopefully we resolve it at the lowest level internally. We want to talk about the employer's responsibility. We, as an employer of DOT, should use reasonable care to prevent harassment from occurring. Um, we have the sexual harassment policy that's in place. We have systematic training, such as this and such as other training. As a result of an investigation, we may do individual training uh, or additional training for certain units or um, divisions as needed. And um, there should be an awareness of what's going on in the workplace. Um, you shouldn't be a director or supervisor that um, has the attitude that I really don't care about those types of things. I'm just going to ignore it. Because as a supervisor and manager, um, that's one of your responsibilities is to address these issues by um, letting the employees that, super, that you supervise know that they should come to you and by reporting it to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity immediately. So as an agency, we should take prompt remedial action to correct harassment, and we take steps to end the harassment so that it doesn't continue. We, we should be conducting prompt and neutral investigations, um, and we should have a disciplinary policy. So as you should know, if, if there is a um, alleged violation of a policy in general um, that human resources, labor relations would be involved with a fact-finding investigation um, for issues that have to do with sexual harassment, uh, the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity conducts an investigation um, that should be looking at both sides and neutral um, to determine the evidence and as a result we do not recommend any discipline but if there is a substantiated charge of sexual harassment it would go to human resources labor relations to have that determination and that review to decide what the appropriate corrective action should be for any individuals so that's not a call that our office makes but it, that's the process at DOT so we do have a disciplinary process, and it's a progressive discipline process. So if it's the first time something occurs, there's a lower level of discipline or corrective action, as opposed to somebody who's done this and had the same offense two or three times, and it's the third time happening, that's where they would be, uh, um, like instead of a three-day suspension, a five or a ten-day, or you know whatever the bargaining unit um, would uh, would have as determined by human resources. Um, so uh, as an agency we should use preventative and corrective opportunities um, other than training you know if you have a staff meeting if you're a supervisor or manager if you have tailgate talks um, and I know we do this periodically to remind the staff of our policies such as sexual harassment prevention and you know if things come up you know nip it in the bud. Um, even if it's just a small comment, you know, and it doesn't result in, you know, somebody feeling that there's sexual harassment, you can address it as a supervisor and say, um, you know, just so that you all understand, um, this is what our policy is, there should be no sexual harassment, you know, and let's make sure that we don't um, have anything uh, occurring going forward. So staff meetings and communication are really helpful. Another best practice, obviously, don't sexually harass people. Um, avoid having men and women work together does not solve the problem, and it is not an option. 
Um, in C CHRO's training on these slides, one of the things they brought up was that there was a study shown that some agencies in response to the changing sexual harassment laws were not hiring um, women because there was a fear of uh, more sexual harassment claims, but that should not be happening, especially in uh, Connecticut where we have policies about diversity and policies about equal opportunity. Um, and it's usually not an option to, to just not have them working together, men and women. Um, training employees and demand that employees treat each other um, respectfully. Um, respecting each other is, is always the best practice. And whether or not you like someone, whether or not you um, have issues with their personality or their style, you can treat them with respect. You know, I would say whether it's deserved or not. Um, because it reflects on you as an individual and uh, promotes a cooperative workplace. Um, so um, expecting all employees to act that way um, and to not engage in sexual harassment is something that we, we should be doing. Periodically renew and reinforce our training and our policies. That's something that our office is doing in conjunction with the commissioner's office and uh, use examples so that uh, the employees would know what they're faced with. So we've talked about examples already and we'll talk about a few more and when we talk about the DOT policy um, so that um, everybody understands. If you also look at the sexual harassment policy, uh, we list examples in that policy so that everyone knows what we're talking about. And that's not an exhaustive list. Um, these days, there could be things that are uh, done with a computer or with a cell phone that um, could be sexually harassing that weren't even um, put to paper when we made the policy, but they could still be sexual harassment. Do not hold workplace trainings or other events in inappropriate places. Do not hold meetings in strip clubs. We need to say that, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Monitor technology. Um, as a state employee, if you don't know, uh, a lot of our um, computer usage is monitored. And when you log into your computer, first thing in the morning, if you if you have a computer, um, there's a, a message about that, that we all have to follow the state acceptable use policy. And emails that are sent are always subject to freedom of information. So we shouldn't be putting things that are inappropriate in emails for work um, that could be discoverable and used um, as evidence and um, just be careful about what's put into emails as well. What is an employer legally liable for? Um, DOT has to be uh, liable for the conduct of its supervisory staff. Of uh, The supervisors and managers are people that act uh, as the employer's agent in the sense that you know they're responsible for making sure the behavior stops, making sure the behavior is reported to equal opportunity diversity so it can be addressed. And if it's not addressed, that can be an issue. Uh, conduct of non-supervisory employees, if it knew or should have known of the conduct and failed to take prompt and effective corrective action. So that gets into some a legal term there of known or should have known um, that's something that over the years with sexual harassment laws has become the standard. So an, an agency cannot say, I didn't know about this. That happened in a unit under my supervision, but I didn't know what was going on in that unit. I don't know those people intimately. I, I don't see them very often. How was I to know um, that there was sexual harassment going on? Well, the law says that you should have known. So you can be liable to have address that inappropriate behavior if um, if it's shown and you know that um, that you should have known about it can an employee be personally liable for sexual harassment yes for uh, such as retaliation um, there's other laws that could come into play that you could be held um, liable 
on a, a civil basis. Um, and aiding and abetting could fall into that category when it comes to having, um, you know, participated in, you know, preventing issues from being addressed or preventing, uh, protecting individuals so that there was uh, no complaint filed. You know, retaliation has to do with um, trying to harm someone and give them a, a lesser job assignment or um, treat them in, a, in an adverse way uh, as a result of them trying to file a discrimination complaint and um, that is against their policies. So if, those, if that situation occurs, an employee can bring a claim of retaliation to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity and we would investigate that to determine if there is a basis to say that retaliation did occur. But a person could also be liable individually um, for that. If you're um, acting on uh, behalf of DOT in your role and in your title within DOT, um, you can have um, representation and um, defense as long as you were doing your job um, and you were your actions were within the realm of your regular job duties. If you were acting inappropriately, you may not have that defense. Um, and I'm not a legal expert and I don't claim to be, but if you have questions about these things, contact the legal office. Other best practices. Um, having a complaint reporting procedure is one of those. Now this training applies to all employers, even small ones, um, contractors and things like that. So as a state agency and a large state agency, we've had a complaint reporting procedure. So this isn't really an issue for us. It's pretty clear when anybody comes to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity, we provide them a copy of the com discrimination complaint process. And that outlines, you know, the, the length of time, um, you know, the fact that we have a review process. Um, we have up to 90 days, um, our investigations if we do investigate, go to the commissioner for review, and sometimes we can handle issues through mediation or through informal means at the lowest level. So we do have a complaint reporting process, and um, there are clear steps, as I mentioned a couple of times, so that you can report to a supervisor and manager, but managers and supervisors need to immediately report those issues directly to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. Uh, when we do investigate, it's important to select the investigator carefully, consider the potential effects uh, or the potential conflicts of interest, maintain neutrality. Um, and these are things that as the director we consider uh, in uh, uh, any kind of investigation, it's important to, to maintain neutrality. And um, if you're related to one of the parties or, you know, have some sort of a, a outside relationship, you know, that might compromise um, the perception that the investigation is fair, you might remove yourself and assign it to another person. Um, you should listen, listen, listen. Um, that's what we do in our office. Um, if someone comes with a complaint of discrimination or sexual harassment, the first thing we try to do is to set up a meeting and talk to the person to find out what the issue is, to try and help them with the complaint process and um, you know, sometimes it may not exactly be what they're asking for. There, there might be another process that would be more suited to their complaint. So we try to refer them to the right place. Um, we try to get names of witnesses, follow up with the witnesses, document the witness interviews, and follow company policy. You know, we try to interview people that provide names of witnesses. Um, it's not always that we would interview every person, but we would try to identify those that um, did actually see or hear something in relation to the uh, incident in question. So the investigation is important for the employer, um, and if we fail to investigate, that could be a problem. So um, employees' morale may go down if they feel that issues are not being uh, investigated and handled. 
and there have been settlements um, for things like that. So, um, but uh, again, we encourage people to, to bring these issues uh, to our attention so that we can address them. Employer's investigation, again, um, what it does is it insulates the employer from liability because it um, should show that the employer DOT takes reasonable care to prevent harassment and um, that in some cases if the employee um, did not take advantage of the corrective action that the employer provided it will also take care of our liability and that means just that the complaint process was offered to the employer and to the employee and they decided not to use it decided not to file a complaint and so um, we're not at fault because we we offered that process to them and when we do substantiate harassment um, we have the queer progressive discipline policy and um, we have to apply it consistently and um, you know in the office of equal opportunity and diversity we review um, discipline monthly to determine if any patterns are occurring because we're responsible for you know um, looking at the entire employment process for fairness and um, the progressive discipline should be documented and uh, make sure that the tone of the correspondence is professional and factual and uh, if it's not substantiated we may have retraining um, even if there is you know no substantiation to the charges so when affirmative action equal opportunity diversity does our investigation one of the things that we often recommend is training um, because even if you've had the training once it doesn't hurt to have it again because we do forget things um, so um, you know we understand that sometimes it's, it's hard to remember all the things that we cover uh, it's just the way we are as humans we don't retain everything so um, and if, if that's helpful, we, we recommend that. Okay. Um, the remedy can depend on the severity and the pervasiveness of the harassment. And as I mentioned, um, relo relocating the harasser might be one possible solution, and that has to be done with in conjunction with human resources and the managers involved. And um, counseling the harasser, providing additional training, suspending the harasser. Uh, again, everyone has the right to due process. So you, if you're accused of sexual harassment, there should be an investigation that gives you the opportunity to provide your statement and your side of the story and um, any witnesses that um, might have seen or heard something in relation to the incident. And, um, you know, if severe or pervasive behavior is repeated, you know, termination may be in order. So I just sometimes hear people feel that um, just because um, an investigation occurred, um, and even if it was substantiated, the outcome that was desired is that the person be terminated. But that is not always a call that we get to make. That's determined by human resources. So a progressive discipline policy um, is such that, you know, uh, depends on the, the severity of the behavior and it depends on, you know, whether it's occurred in the past and it should be looked at in, in consistency and there's a, there's a, a method to that. Um, so it, it doesn't mean that any charge of sexual harassment is going to result in termination, but it does mean that we do treat every situation seriously and um, we try to uh, handle things promptly to make sure that people understand sexual harassment is not, should not be tolerated. And the hope with corrective action is that the employer, the employee that made the mistake or ma did the behavior that they were accused of, or at least it was found substantiated that they may have done it, um, that they uh, they learn and they correct their behavior and become a productive employee. 
Let's look at quiz number three. Number one says, who should be interviewed during the course of an internal investigation of a sexual harassment complaint? A, the complainant, B, the alleged harasser, C, identified witnesses, or all of the above? And the answer is all of the above. Um, you have to interview both the complainant and the alleged harasser and any identified witnesses, which um, sometimes is subject to the investigator uh, so that the, with the witnesses, as long as they're appropriate and had something to do with the situation. But yes, all of the above. Number two, should an employer immediately transfer an employee who profiles a sexual harassment complaint out of the harasser's unit to prevent more harm? A, yes, the employer needs to take steps to prevent ongoing harassment. B, no, the allegations might not be true and nothing should be done until after investigation. C, maybe the employer can propose a transfer for, for the protection of the employee, but the employee must consent. And so uh, it's C. Um, it, usually you would not transfer an employee who files the claim, but you can in the situation when they consent to it and it's in writing. And that's a requirement by the new law. Number three, true or false, an employer cannot be liable for a manager sexually harassing an employee if the sexual harassment is not reported. And that's a true, the employer not liable for harassment they do not know about. B, false, employers can be liable for the conduct of supervisory staff even if harassment is not reported. The answer is false. Um, Employers can be liable for the conduct of supervisory staff even if the harassment is not reported. That's the known or should have known uh, language. Uh, number four, true or false, an employer cannot fire an employee because they filed a complaint of sexual harassment that turned out to be unsubstantiated. True, firing an employee just for filing a sexual harassment complaint in good faith is a legal retaliation, or B, false. If the complainant turns out to be unsubstantiated, the employee has no protections and could be terminated. Well, the answer is A. Um, firing an employee for just cause, just for filing a complaint in good faith is, is a legal retaliation. Um, it's you know taken against the person for the fact that they filed. And an unsubstantiated claim what that means is that there was not enough evidence to show the behavior occurred. That doesn't mean that it occurred or didn't occur. It just shows whether or not there's enough evidence to uh, show that a pol the policy was violated. Um, so that should not be the basis for a termination. Okay, I'm going to show you a brief video that um, looks into the fact that sexual harassment can also be uh, occurring um, against males and this is a video um, that talks a little bit about that and about um, why sometimes um, you know females and males fail to report sexual harassment because of fear either of um, getting the other person in trouble or um, other reasons maybe embarrassment um, you know this is something that's personal and they don't want to share um, so this video is a short clip that talks a little bit about that This story has grabbed the headlines mostly because of the big names coming forward. Although women account for the vast majority of sexual harassment claims, men have also been affected, and psychologists say they are much less likely to report the abuse. Josh Laps is another alleged victim who said he had a female boss who relentlessly tried to seduce him. I was assigned to work with this one woman uh, as her intern. And she uh, began. She began almost immediately uh, saying things that were inappropriate and doing things that were inappropriate. She informed me that she had decided that we were going to have sex. She made graphic comments about my body. She started drawing pictures for me of what she thinks I look like naked. She asked me to draw pictures of myself for her, um, and she gave me very graphic depictions of what she had planned for us. Josh said it took some time to realize that he was actually a victim, and he was reluctant to report it. I was reporting to her, so I felt like 
she I, she would be the one I would even have to tell about it. And uh, there was no structure in place to make sure that these things were handled appropriately. Also, she was established. She was senior. They liked her. They didn't know anything about me. I was new and an unknown quantity. Like many other victims of such harassment, he worries that no one would believe him or worse, he would be blamed for the situation. 70% of people who get harassed never even complain internally to anyone, not to their personnel office, not even to their supervisor. And the reason they don't, and this will be the same reason for men and for women, is they are afraid to report. One additional thing, the, we have seen cases where men are being, straight men or gay men, are being harassed by another man. Again, co-worker, supervisor, and I think there that could be yet another reason why a man may not want to come forward, may not want to say that another man is coming on him. The National Sexual Violence Resource Center reports gay men are more likely to become victims of sexual harassment and assault. Another study reported that around 20% of men face sexual harassment in the military. Experts say it's crucial to report these cases. As many employers, once they find out this is going on, they want to fix it quickly. If they don't, we will start an investigation, we'll talk to witnesses. Often, even before we finish our investigation, the employer comes to see there's a problem and there's a settlement at that point. Even with such action, the psychological aspect of harassment can still linger. But as the United States takes such harassment more seriously, the hope is that more male victims will speak up and seek treatment. Dara Digutz, VOA News, Washington. Okay, now we're going to go into the changing world of sexual harassment claims. So, uh, as I alluded to in the beginning, the world is a different place, and uh, Connecticut especially, um, the governor and the legislature have felt that um, more action needs to be taken to protect uh, men and women experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace. But um, all of this comes because of some of these um, high profile names that were in the news like Harvey Weinstein and um, you know some of the celebrities that are on the screen. And um, <clears throat> this statistic here says that 94% of women that are surveyed experience some form of sexual assault. And um, a lot of those cases are not reported. Um, so even though sexual harassment is prevalent in the cases that we deal with, there's probably uh, additional uh, examples of sexual harassment that um, we are not aware of because it's never reported. So the Me Too movement um, had, was in 2019, and um, this study that was done at the University of Houston found that 19% of men said they're now reluctant to hire attractive women. Um, and these are sort of undesirable um, uh, outcomes of the Me Too movement that were not expected. 21% of men said they were reluctant to hire women for jobs in involving close interpersonal act interactions with men, um, especially with lots of travel. And 27% of men said they now avoid one-on-one -on -one meetings with female colleagues. So fear of sexual harassment complaints is leading to more sex discrimination in the, in the sense that if it's, um, it's discriminatory to not hire women um, and hire men instead because you're afraid of potential sexual harassment claims. Uh, and the state of Connecticut and, and, and the federal government have uh, protections to ensure that we are uh, fair in our hiring processes. So um, these are some of the attitudes that maybe some people have, but um, we do need to make sure that we continue to you know, hire um, both men and women for openings. Um, and there should be a, a consciousness that we have about 
um, our behavior and avoiding situations that put us in compromising positions with the opposite sex because of um, the knowledge that there's going to be more potential for a sexual harassment claim. Um, but um, again, um, we, we can't, you know, stop doing the work that we do and stop hiring um, men or women just because of the fact that there could be a potential claim. <clears throat> this is something I'll just touch on briefly is microaggressions. Um, so assuming that women with children have to leave early to take care of their kids um, is an example um, where you would uh, be treating uh, a woman differently um, just because of the fact that they're a woman and you assume that they have child care responsibilities. So the definition is a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude towards a member of a marginalized group. Um, a lot of times these may or may not be a violation of any of our policies, but they might be something that um, is definitely bothering to another person. Um, it may be something that somebody comes to our office to um, get help for. Um, and assuming that men with children do not have child care responsibilities, because maybe they do, um, making sexist jokes, um, all in good fun. Um, you know, asking only the woman at the meeting to take notes um, and get the coffee. And that is if they're all peers, they're all the same job title, um, you know, because sometimes um, taking notes at a meeting is their job function, and that's the job that they were hired to do. Um, but if there is you know, really no difference, you know, and asking only the, the woman to do that when they're all the same job could be discrimination. So just to be conscious of some of these things that are sort of related to sexual harassment but slightly different. Workplace bullying is another one. This is often confused um, because of the question, is it illegal discrimination? It's only illegal discrimination if it is because of somebody's protected class. That means if you are bullying somebody because of the, their skin color, because of their race, because of their sexual orientation, um, because of being a female. These are all protected classes um, that we have, and those could be considered um, discrimination if, if you're bullying because of that reason. But if you're bullying somebody just because um, you don't like the person, if you're bullying them because um, you had a, an argument with them and you want to get back at them, and it's really not related to your skin color, it's not related to your gender and things like that, um, these are not things that Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity handles. This would not be a policy violation. Unfortunately, there's no law yet um, that has to do with um, um, bullying in the workplace. Um, but if the person's behavior is a violation of the workplace um, conduct and behavior, uh, HR memorandum, that could be something that needs to be reported and handled um, through the chain of command, through supervisors, possibly investigated as a fact finding. Um, if their behavior um, falls onto, under the um, jurisdiction of that policy. So um, that could be a policy violation, but in general, um, there's not a, a, a law that um, protects somebody from any form of workplace bullying when it's not on the basis of um, race, sex, and protected class status. Um, and the contracts with the unions um, might also speak about affirmative action. I'm not aware that they have something pertaining to bullying, but they, they may. Again, I don't claim to be an expert on the union contracts, but you can check with your union rep. Gender identity, um, we, we touched on a little bit. Um, what to do about restrooms? That's a common question that people have. And I think I already addressed that. It's important to ensure that all employees have a convenient, safe, and dignified restroom to use. 
and we have to allow individuals that are transgender to use a bathroom consistent with their gender identity. So gender identity means they have not necessarily had gender reassignment surgery, but they may also just identify as the opposite sex. They may dress in a certain way, identifying with the opposite sex than what they were born as. And the law in Connecticut protects them to use the bathroom that they identify with. And I always tell people, whether or not you agree with the law, um, I'm just the messenger reporting to you what the law says. And this is the state that we live in, and this is what um, we have to follow. Um, and sometimes people may have feelings about it. And I guess I can understand that. So, When protections, when protected classes clash, what about employees um, that have other protected concerns? like religious objections. Um, so other, all employees have the right to work in an environment that's respectful. People do not need to agree or believe in the same thing. So if, if a person has um, a practice of their faith and their religion that you know requires certain things, uh, maybe even accommodations in the workplace, um, Affirmative action handles um, accommodations for religion. If you contact us, if you need that, you know, let us know. Um, such as sometimes a place to have a, a prayer during your workday, or you know, um, maybe an adjustment to um, your time, um, your start and end time. Um, sometimes uh, faith and religions have. Uh, holidays and events that happen on uh, certain days of the week and at sundown. And so, um, you know, maybe the work day might take you past sundown at certain times of the year. So there's things that could be addressed. Um, and, you know, if you have a question, contact us. Um, just as, a, as an employee of DOT, we want to be respectful of all cultures and different religious beliefs. Sexual harassment, again, um, is not limited to the male against female. And here's a, a court case from Connecticut that um, is an example of that, that found employers liable for anti-gay harassment and awarded um, the victim $94,500. And that had to do with emotional uh, distress damages. So these are, are issues that can be very um, expensive in liability and legal costs for having to um, spend the time prosecuting um, these types of cases when we can try to prevent them at an early stage. So let's take a look at quiz number four. There's five quizzes. We're getting towards the end. And this question number one says, sexual harassment must involve people of different genders, true or false? Um, it's false. You could be the same gender. Number two, workplace harassment against LGBT individuals is not illegal as long as it is based on religious belief. Um, that's false. In the state of Connecticut, um, there are protections for uh, sexual orientation as well as gender identity or expression. And so um, harassment in the workplace against those individuals um, would be illegal under state law. Not necessarily federal, but um, which could be federal, I guess, under um, maybe certain thing, things, but um, definitely the state law has a protection. Um, and, you know, one religious belief doesn't necessarily um, trump the other. Um, but these are things that are dealt with on a case by case basis. Um, and, uh, we also have to protect people's religious beliefs. So, um, you know, a person shouldn't have to um, violate their own conscience and their faith in order to um, take a certain action that is contrary to that. So if these issues come up, you can always contact our office and we can assist with that. All right, so we wanna talk about the filing of a complaint of discrimination and what that process looks like. So again, we talk about a complaint of discrimination. 
which could be race, could be color, could be age, but it's the same process. And, you know, primarily we're talking about sexual harassment as a form of discrimination. So employees must file um, complaints of employment discrimination with um, CHRO or EEOC, even if they plan to litigate a complaint in court. Now, what this doesn't say is that in DOT, you have an internal process that you can and should um, try to avail yourself of before going to CHRO. Um, you always have the right to go to CHRO or external agency, but um, we do offer our internal process to handle your complaint. And uh, But if, if you're going to CHRO, you should go to their, their process before going to litigate in court. And after filing, um, the employee can request to release a jurisdiction and a right to sue letter to be able to go to, to take the case to court. Um, this is all CHRO information because these are their slides, but these are the, the cities where they have CHRO offices, and their main office is located in Hartford at 450 Columbus Boulevard. Um, their website is ct.gov slash CHRO. And in case you were wondering about the protected classes in Connecticut, there are several, and you see some of them here. You know, we've talked about a, a few of them, uh, age, uh, ancestry, color, religion, religious creed, um, retaliation is protected, veteran status, um, that was actually a recent change, um, learning disability, mental disability. Um, and we all fall under any or, or several of these categories. So um, even as a, a white male uh, person, myself, um, sometimes uh, there could be discrimination on the basis of being male as opposed to female, um, and there could be, uh, you know, any particular uh, type of discrimination based on, you know, faith, uh, based on disability. Um, so um, these are all the classes in Connecticut. And we've talked about the 300-day filing deadline for CHRO cases. Let's take a look at quiz number five. This is the last one. And number one says, what are the remedies that a judge can award in a sexual harassment case? A, back pay, B, emotional distress, C, liquidated damages, or D, A, and B? Well, again, I'm not a legal expert. I don't know what liquidated damages are, but the answer is A and B. You can award back pay and emotional distress, um, and that would be the answer. Number two, how long does an employee have to file a sexual harassment complaint at the CHRO? It's 300 days, D, if the event took place after October 1st, 2019. Um, number three, where does someone initially file an employment discrimination complaint? Um, and this would be after the employee takes advantage of the internal process at DOT. But again, this training is for all employers. So if an employer doesn't have an internal process, they would go directly to CHRO. And the place that they can file their complaint directly uh, at the initial stage would be CHRO or EEOC. Um, not the IRS, not federal court um, and state court until after CHRO. Oops. Number four, which of the following is not a protected class in the state of Connecticut? Um, is it A, sex, B, race, or C, the use of recreational marijuana? Well, C. Um, in Connecticut, it's not a protected class yet, although there is medical use of marijuana um, that has some, uh, some people have the ability to use, but um, definitely not. Um, a protected class in Connecticut for the recre recreational use. If you have any questions with the CHRO portion of the training, which we're ending now, this is the website that you, or the email that you can use, chro.questions at ct.gov, and CHRO will respond to you um, and to any of your questions that you have.
or you can call them by phone, 541-3400. Uh, at the end of this training, I'll also have a, an email that you can contact to ask questions of the DOT uh, Equal Opportunity Diversity staff, and we will respond to your question. So there's just a few more slides to go over that have to do with some additional things. And um, the slides already did talk about the statistics at EEOC, but this one just shows that there have been several lawsuits at EEOC, and there's been an increase in sexual harassment cases, more than 50%. Um, from 2017 to 2018 as a result of the Me Too movement. And um, as well as, you know, that's federal cases. THRO has had 279 claims of sexual harassment in 2019. That was up from 235. So it's a very prevalent um, type of complaint that we get. These are some of the laws that were not discussed yet that sort of do pertain to sexual harassment in uh, a law 15-56 that protects interns from workplace harassment and 15-213 has to do with the voyeurism laws and invasions of privacy. You could be in violation of, of different laws for you know taking images without a person's consent. And these are the two laws that make up the Times Up Act 19-16 and 19-93 having to do with combating sexual assault and sexual harassment. So I want you to please take a look at the DOT sexual harassment policy. You should be given the policy uh, or you can download it online so that you can review it and be familiar with it. And um, right now we're going to talk about a few of the high points of the policy. So the policy of course applies to all DOT employees and uh, it applies to any work-related activity or uh, any work-related assignment or location. It establishes a complaint reporting procedure so that there is a process and there's a contact information provided if you need to file a complaint. There is uh, uh, language that if there's a failure to report a known incident, you could be subject to disciplinary action. And that would be if you're a supervisor or a manager and you know about the sexual harassment, have not reported it, you could be subject to discipline. Um, you should report sexual harassment to any member of management. You can also report it to the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity directly, um, but managers and supervisors must report all incidents of sexual harassment. It also has language that false accusations will be subject to disciplinary action. Here are some other highlights of the DOT sexual harassment prevention policy and reporting procedure. We will not tolerate sexual harassment of any kind by its employees. It undermines the integrity of the of the work relationship. Um, it applies to any employee, volunteer, contractor, subcontractor, um, as long as they're operating within the DOT workplace because people have a right to work and be free of discrimination and sexual harassment. Any employee who engages in the conduct that's prohibited by the policy will be subject to disciplinary action up to including termination. That's in the policy. So again, that means that if our office investigates and substantiates that there was sexual harassment, it goes to Human Resources, Labor Relations, for them to review and determine the appropriate level of corrective action. Um, also, retaliation against an employee for reporting sexual harassment is a violation of the sexual harassment policy. So retaliation does not mean that an employee um, who has is going to have a poor service rating, um, that that would be considered retaliation if it was something that was already going to happen. Um, retaliation is something that is shown sometimes through our investigation that it was only for the reason of deterring somebody from en engaging in the discrimination complaint process and filing a complaint um, that someone um, took action and adverse action against them for that purpose only and not for other purposes related to maybe their poor performance at work um, because as a supervisor, you still have an expectation that the employees 
should all be performing their jobs um, appropriately. Managers and supervisors are in a unique position to prevent sexual harassment. So what I wanted to emphasize is that managers can set an example, monitor their workplace, know your employees, talk to them, find out if they're uncomfortable and not talking to one another. You know, is it related to something like sexual harassment so that we can deal with it before it becomes a bigger issue? Um, one of the main things that we emphasize a few times about contacting affirmative action, documenting the actions that you take if you're a supervisor, that can help protect you in an investigation to show that on such date, you know, you referred the matter to affirmative action. And on such date, you know, I spoke to the employee about their behavior. Um, and those are important things. If we don't have documentation and it affects another employee, um, and we look to see if there's a pattern, um, without documentation, we won't be able to see that pattern. Um, so it's very important. Um, as a manager and supervisor, be aware of our policy and procedures and be able to, um, you know, understand what that means and what your responsibilities are, which we emphasize over and over through this training. Um, so when no complaint is made and a supervisor notices the conduct, um, even if they're not sure if it's sexual harassment, um, you know, it's important to at least, you know, do your, your job to, to address the behavior. Um, and my, my rule is that if, if it's something that you witness that you put an end to and the behavior stops, that's fine. You don't need to um, consult us. But when an employee comes to you and says, I feel I'm being sexually harassed, you need to immediately contact the Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity. Um, okay. So even when an employee says, I don't really want to report this. I don't want to get the person in trouble. The supervisor has an obligation to report it to our Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity or up the chain of command so that um, it can be addressed. And you can tell the employee that um, because we're mandated reporters. Uh, we can't just keep it quiet because like we mentioned before, um, we're liable if we knew or should have known about the conduct. So we've covered examples, but just so that we're absolutely clear what is sexual harassment and what is not, there's really three different types that we usually talk about, verbal, nonverbal, and physical. Um, flirtation, advances, propositions, discussing, discussing sexual activities, talking about a person's body, making sexual innuendos that imply you know, sexual acts and things, kidding and teasing, making practical jokes. These are all verbal types of sexual harassment derogatory comments about a person's gender or sexual orientation, making fun of them, um, calling them a sissy, or, you know, maybe one time it might not be sexual harassment, but if it's a repeated over and over thing, then that can be uh, possibly a complaint that has to be dealt with. Nonverbal is another type, and so nonverbal would be the pictures, the cartoons, drawings, um, sometimes uh, written comments and language, um, if it's of a sexual nature and suggestive, could be sexual harassment. Using body language and gestures, whistling at somebody, staring at somebody could be sexual harassment. Um, displaying sexual materials, including those viewed or sent on email or on the internet. I don't think we've mentioned it, but even if it's your break time, even if it's your, your lunch time, and you're looking at some video or watching something on your phone, and maybe that's your personal phone, you're still in the workplace, um, and you should not be sharing sexually oriented or inappropriate pictures and videos with coworkers because somebody is probably going to be offended. So if we can keep the things that we share in the workplace um, appropriate to the workplace, um, we should not get into trouble for that. Um, but that's a potential complaint that could be handled through our office. Um, 
any text messages, phone calls, or sexual pictures. There should be no sexual pictures, no suggestive text messages or phone calls. Um, and you don't want to bother somebody or pester somebody um, or continue calling them if they're not interested because then there could be um, something that they would report to us that we would have to handle. Physical sexual harassment would be obviously unwelcome touching, patting, restraining somebody, movement, brushing against their body, back rubs, shoulder rubs, any kind of un unwanted sexual conduct and conduct of a sexual nature. If it's uh, sexual assault, we have to report it to the police. Um, so what is acceptable behavior? Um, it's A lot of people say it seems like I can't do anything anymore. So usually without the restrictions on our, our social distancing, handshakes would normally be fine. And um, hugging, um, you know, sometimes people can be friends for years and they always greeted each other with a hug or a, a sort of a quick hug and a pat and that's just what they're used to and maybe people are just more huggy type of people but in the workplace be conscious that some people don't appreciate that they have a um, they don't appreciate being touched um, hopefully you know the person and don't assume anything about a person especially a new person to the workplace basically there is no work-related reason the need to hug someone. And this probably shouldn't be an issue right now with social distancing. Um, whenever you share anything, um, whether it be on a phone or um, a paper, it should be work-appropriate non-sexual material. And that's acceptable. Um, what you do after work is your own business. As long as it's consensual, it's off state property, that's your, your time, that's your own business. But we have to say it and a certain caveat that unless there is a connection with someone at work, if you are in a relationship with someone and then the relationship gets broken off and you have to work with that person, there's going to be feelings and there's going to be uncomfortableness and that might have to be dealt with. Um, so just be aware of that. <clears throat> we want to treat one another with respect and dignity in the workplace in a non-discriminatory manner, whether you're a supervisor or an employee, and it always adhere to our department policies and procedures. You can contact um, my work number at 860-594-2211. Um, that's a confidential line, and we are available for counseling and for supervisors that are looking for a guidance on how to deal with situations, or we're happy to do that. Um, actually, during the current um, environment due to COVID-19, it might be best to email us, um, Ada Alvarez, Jerry Beckford, or myself. Um, you can find their emails in the phone listing. Uh, mine is uh, eric.d.smith at ct.gov, eric.d.smith at ct.gov. Um, but I'll show you on the next slide that you can email any questions that you have about sexual harassment or this training at this email, dot.shtraining at ct.gov. And we will respond to those questions that you have to try and help um, you understand or address any concerns that you have. Thank you very much for participating in the training today. And um, thank you for meeting the requirement for the state of Connecticut. Take care.